RSVP. Uh, good morning, my name is Paul Craney. I'm the spokesperson of Massachusetts Fiscal Alliance. And um, we are joined with all of the New England states organizations from those states, uh, Maine, Vermont, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. New Hampshire is not included because they are not uh, part of a, um, a group of states that are being bound to California's regulations and bans on internal combustion engines due to an executive order that was signed in 2020 by the governor of California. Uh, today, we're launching this new coalition and uh, we're gonna have the different organizations speak from New England. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Chip Ford from CLT, and then Nick Murray from Maine Policy Institute. And then we're gonna go to Meg Hansen from Ethan Allen Institute Mike Stenhouse from Rhode Island, and then we'll go to Chris Herb from Connecticut. And then we'll just take some questions, but you should all have the letter. We're gonna be blasting it out to our press list, to our members. Uh, Mass Fiscal's also mailing it to all the 200 lawmakers and our governor. Uh, what this coalition hopes to do is to highlight this issue to the public, highlight it to media, highlight it to elected officials, so people are aware of what's happening in their state. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Chip Ford, and he's going to talk a little bit uh, to why he thinks this is not a good idea for Massachusetts. Thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Chip Ford. I'm executive director of Citizens for Limited Taxation. Uh, this is another one of those situations that demonstrates the failure of the so-called uh, multi-state compacts. Uh, it's a growing trend uh, creating them. Uh, we recently defe uh, defeated the Transportation Climate Initiative, uh, and it's obvious that they're becoming more uh, in use. Uh, the amorphous, unelected bureaucrats who are eroding state so uh, sovereignty, it avoids transparency and eliminates any accountability to citizens whatsoever. Uh, they, it allows uh, elected representatives to dodge difficult votes. And once created, they expand and take, off, take on a life of their own on automatic pilot. Citizens don't support autopilot laws, such as the automatic gas tax, the voters Massachusetts repealed on the 2014 ballot. Uh, we don't think that this is a good idea. We don't think that one size fits all. Uh, uh, Louis Brandeis, the Justice of the Supreme Court, noted that states were the laboratories of democracy. Uh, we're hoping that we can bring accountability back to any, any of these laws, the, especially something as, as radical as this, banning internal combustion engines. We hope to, uh, I was shocked when I, when I learned about this, and I'm sure that most citizens in Massachusetts are going to be equally as shocked. So we hope to educate the citizens. We hope to be able to turn this around. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Paul. Good morning. This is Nick Murray with Maine Policy Institute. Uh, we're a nonprofit in the state of Maine that advocates for economic freedom and individual liberty. Uh, the geographical area of Maine is nearly equal that to the other five New England states. Uh, in, in other words, we are extremely rural. <laughs> So that's why we are concerned by both the California internal combustion engine ban and the proposed advanced clean trucks program. Um, unfortunately, working Mainers have been at the whim of out of state politicians like Governor Newsom and the unelected bureaucrats at Maine Department of Edu uh, Environmental Protection uh, because of their routine technical rulemaking process. Uh, Mainers are not allowed legislative input on that. Uh, so continuing to follow California will impose a substantial burden on our low and moderate income Mainers, especially. Uh, living in rural areas demands that more of our paychecks go to fuel, and that's just uh, the way it is. Um, the Advanced Clean Trucks program will also drive higher transportation costs around the economy, further inflating the price of goods shipped by truck and affecting the, affecting the entire region. Thankfully, in December 2021, uh, Maine Department of Environmental Protection postponed its rulemaking on adopting the Advanced Clean Trucks program for at least a year. We're cautiously, cautiously optimistic um, that, that, will, that will maintain uh, and they will include public comment in those and invite the business community uh, to offer its, its resources 
um, in, in making that policy. In conclusion, following California regulations is simply not feasible amid record inflation and a supply chain crunch that continues to drive up costs for all New Englanders and all Americans. Uh, maybe this made sense for Maine in 2001, but it certainly does not in 2022. Real questions still exist about whether we can achieve our governor's ambitious electric vehicle adoption goals and real questions remain whether the New England grid can handle the increased demand of electricity uh, with, with that uh, broader vehicle adoption in the next 10 to 12 years. Um, so today we are calling on the Maine Department of Environmental Protection and our Governor Janet Mills to open rulemaking to sever ties with the California Air and Resources Board uh, so Maine, Mainers can better afford the future of higher energy costs in the economy. Uh, our state motto is Dear Ago, which means I lead. So it's time for Maine to lead. We cannot afford to follow California anymore. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Meg Hansen. I'm the president of the Ethan Allen Institute, which is Vermont's premier center-right think tank. We are committed to policies that are based on the principles of free enterprise, a constitutional and limited government, and individual liberty. Thank you to Paul Craney and the Massachusetts Fiscal Alliance for organizing this important press conference. EEI is very proud to stand with all our coalition members. First, I'd like to say that Vermont is not a colony of California. It is anti-democratic and irrational for, Vermonter, for Vermont lawmakers to cede a regulatory authority over our state's vehicle standards to another state. In the year 2000, the state of Vermont adopted California's low emission vehicle criteria as well as zero emission vehicle regulations. Minimizing air pollution by regulating tailpipe emissions is one thing, but imposing a blanket ban on the dominant vehicle technology is an entirely another thing. Second, technology bans and mandates cannot succeed in the absence of affordable alternatives. Banning gasoline powered vehicles cannot and will not force a transition to zero emission vehicles because ZEV technology is not affordable or easily available at present. Electric vehicles or EVs have miles to go before they can compete in the market without the aid of government subsidies and tax credits. So real solutions would focus on improving EV technology today, which involves giving the process time, all the time it needs and all the space it needs to fail and to evolve. Simply commanding that internal combustion engines become obsolete by an arbitrary year like 2030 or 2035 achieves nothing but political points. Finally, today I saw um, a the AP reported that we have record high, record high inflation and record high gas prices. So really in the face of growing inflation and high gas prices, Vermont policymakers need to expand choices and not limit our ability to commute to work or put food on the table. Vermont is a really rural state um, we cannot, you know, we are a small state, but we're really rural and we can't afford to have public transportation. I mean, apart from the Burlington micropolitan area in the Northwest, there's no concept of public transportation or, or you know, any of these progressive ideas in the rest of the state. So, you know, we have to really think about expanding choices and not limiting them. The vast majority of Vermonters the vast majority of Americans don't have disposable income to ride inflation waves and to stick it to the man or to stick it to the Russian man as so many people in positions of power and influence are demanding and calling for. And to conclude, speaking of moral imperatives, we should not, we cannot implement policies that will make the average Vermonter poorer. So, Having said this, I understand that our legislature is very, um, you know, far left. And in terms of actionable items, I don't know what can happen. However, we can raise awareness of this. Uh, we can get every Vermonter, whether they are on the center or, or left, I mean, everybody is a consumer of fossil fuels. 
this is, as I said, the dominant technology. So I'm really hopeful that we can raise awareness and get these, these concepts of what's happening from California and including in Vermont, get this information out to every single person. And I hope that the media will help us in, in informing every single Vermonter and every single American affected by California's draconian law. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Stenhouse. Uh, I'm the CEO for the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. Our mission is to advance free market solutions and, uh, and to uh, push for limited government governments. And I um, join it with my colleagues in agreeing that it is not limited government when our state is, re is beholden to adopt uh, oppressive standards adopted by another state. Uh, so that that's clear, you know, and, and this same coalition, many of these same people of the 29 groups that signed this letter and the six or seven, five or six states here today, you know, we, we helped uh, motorists dodge a bullet last year in defeating the TCI gas tax. And now our goal is to raise awareness about these, these oppressive California emission standards that, that many of our states are beholden to enact ourselves. Um, you know, Motorists across America and in Rhode Island are outraged at the increase in gas taxes. But that's nothing compared to what's coming if these California standards are, are uh, if we're forced to adopt those. Right here in Rhode Island, a conservative senator and a progressive left uh, secretary of state and candidate for governor have both called on our state to temporarily halt the gas tax to save motorists maybe that $35, $40 every time they fill up their gas tax. But imagine what politicians and motorists are going to think when they realize they're going to have to pay tens of thousands more dollars to buy a car in the near future, because they'll be forced to buy a, a much higher cost electric vehicle. What are politicians and motorists going to say then? So the answer is not a Band-Aid like lowering gas taxes. The answer is for states to craft their own in energy policies, to move away from these costly green policies. And we call today on state lawmakers to begin the process, begin the debate, to decouple ourselves from California's costly emission standards. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Chris Herb. I'm the president of the Connecticut Energy Marketers Association. Uh, we represent uh, home heating oil dealers, propane dealers, and gasoline distributors. Our members own and operate uh, about a thousand gas stations in Connecticut. Uh, I join my colleagues here uh, in a call for the Connecticut legislature to repeal the law that automatically adopts uh, the California regulations. When the Connecticut General Assembly did this, they never conceived that a governor's order uh, would end up dictating policy in Connecticut. Uh, the normal process for adopting these types of regulations is what the legislature uh, conceived of when they, they, they passed this law. And we asked that, uh, that allowing a, the king of another state to dictate to the people of Connecticut the types of cars that they have to drive, limiting ch uh, consumer choice is something that is not in the best interest of the state of Connecticut, and it was not uh, it was not something that legislators would have would have adopted if they did not cede their autonomy and authority to the governor of California. This is not just about uh, that issue; it is about consumers. If you are required to buy an electric vehicle, there's more to it than just plugging it in when you bring it home. It requires a homeowner to upgrade their electrical service that comes at a hefty fee specialized charging equipment. This is more than, it, it, will, it will increase the used car market. It'll increase costs. This is about low and middle income families who don't have the ability to be able to afford what it actually takes for this to be adopted. It's not just about expensive electric vehicles. The people in Connecticut and Fairfield County who have amongst the highest incomes in the country can do this without mandates. The low and middle income people in Connecticut are going to struggle to be able to keep up. So we join everyone here today to call on the repeal of this. ISO New England recently warned that our electric grid is fragile. They warned they may have to do planned blackouts, exponentially increasing the use of electricity in this region 
puts our energy security at extreme risk. And if we if the states do not act now, we might be living in a blackout condition in the future. So thank you very much. And I'll hand it back to Paul. Thank you, Chris. Um, so yeah, this is an experimental program that we're 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 charting ourselves. Uh, and you can see there's many common themes here. I would remiss to say that this uh, California regulation ice ban would impact 16 states. The letter is signed by 15 of those 16 states. Um, and at this point, uh, we would like to take any questions. So if uh, anyone in the media has any question, just unmute yourself and uh, hopefully we can answer. Sure, this is Skip Murphy from GraniteRock.com. We are New Hampshire's largest and most influential political blog site. Um, with this press release, I guess my question is, who do you think you're going to impact? Those folks in the other 15 states that signed? Um, have you gotten to the point where you think that uh, you will make a mark to stop this? And I'm certainly with you on this. You know, my question is always, is this the proper role of government? And it obviously is not, because it's turning them from, from being governors to rulers. And I'm uh, a little militant on that. Yes, yeah, Skip, so this is day one. Um, it's a process. Uh, it's going to take a lot of education to the public, talking to media, talking to lawmakers so they can understand this issue. Um, but this is just day one, and we're just announcing our coalition. Uh, we did something similar to this about two and a half years ago when the transportation and climate initiative was um, coming out to the public we formed a pretty robust coalition so we're trying to replicate that uh, you are from new hampshire uh, i would be remiss if i didn't say that new hampshire is excluded so obviously new hampshire benefits dramatically if this goes through because it will create a sucking sound for new hampshire where businesses businesses and taxpayers and motorists can go to the, your state and have more options and more choices for how they want to um, purchase a vehicle. Uh, but we're trying to avoid that. Um, I think Walter has a question. Uh, Walter, if you wanna unmute yourself. Great, thanks. Yeah, this is um, Walter Wuthman with WBUR in Boston. Uh, I guess first it's asking for a clarification on how these regulations actually work. I know in Massachusetts, you know, the emission standards are tied to what California sets, but my understanding was that individual states have a lot of leeway in how they actually implement them, the different mechanisms, so that you know an internal combustion engine ban in California doesn't necessarily mean that's the exact same thing Massachusetts has to do. Is am I right in my understanding, or or can you clarify that for me, Chris? Do you want to answer that question? Sure. So. The way that it works is, is that there are a number of these states have passed laws that automatically adopt the California Air Resources Board's uh, regulations. And this is a very different than what has happened in the past. When, when that body has changed regulations, that's what the legislature's conceived of. They, they understood that instead of, uh, there's only two standards in that you can adopt, you have a choice, either EPA standard or California standard. So for instance, when Connecticut decided to do that in other states, um, CARB did not initiate this process. They were ordered, they were ordered by the governor to do this. So this was not, uh, California's regulators saying that this was um, a process that they wanted to uh, to take on, that this was a process that they were ordered to. And at least in Connecticut's case, because I know it best, is that we we never said that we were going to cede authority to a, a, governor's, a, a governor of another state's executive powers. And, and I think that that is the... Um, that's, I think that's what's at issue, at least for us. And, and I think I know a number of states are doing that. So although we, we don't, we're not being forced by the governor directly, the governor's power over the over CARB is how we end up getting these regulations adopted in our states. Does that? Okay. Yeah, thank you. That, that makes sense. So Walter, I think the answer is yes. We're all going to have to adopt this, um, this ban at some point because of Newsom's order. Um, I have a question. Um, oh, sorry, if you wanted to go, go ahead. Go ahead, Amy. 
Okay. Um, hi, this is Amy from the Boston Herald. Um, so I think I'm still maybe missing a part here. So is the goal to um, like, I guess, remove these states from CARB or is the goal just to on this one specific issue to um, like, I guess, like, what is the mechanism here to um, stop this from taking effect? I think there's a few questions there. Um, the goal is right now to educate the public for what's coming up uh, so that even if a state believes that these ice bans are um, something that should be adopted, at least those states can vote on it, debate it, and air out this big policy decision. For a lot of other states, they're going to say, no way, tap the brakes, we never sign up for this. Uh, but there could be some states that say, you know, we like California's carb efficiency standards, but we just don't like this executive order. But again, these are state decisions, I think, that are best dealt at the state level. And uh, I don't think many of these states actually know what's actually happening because of that order in 2020. So, you know, for us in Massachusetts, uh, you know, we will, Mass Fiscal and I think CLT are going to fight pretty hard to make sure that motorists have choices and let motorists in the free market be the one that dictate what people want instead of a governor in California or even politicians in Massachusetts. We like more choices. And I think for us, uh, if any, if the recent events have taught us anything, it's that now's the time to expand choices, expand supply, not restrict, and definitely not ban uh, popular products. Um, as far as the mechanism go, how do you, uh, if you want to uh, remove yourself from CARB, I think there is a blueprint for that. But again, uh, that's th those are decisions that each, I think, state are, is going to have to make. But what I think unifies this group is that no one really knows that these bans are coming. And right now, we want to educate the public on what's uh, scheduled to take place. So, Paul, um, has in California, was this adopted by the legislature or was this an executive order by a governor. It, it's, a, it, it's a governor that issued the a governor issued an executive order to require CARB to promulgate these regulations. The states then adopt them through either reference, and and I and I would agree with Paul that what we're saying is is that the first thing is the public needs to become aware of this. They need to know that the car that they drive today um, will not be they're not going to be able to drive that car after these regulations are adopted by the various states, and and. It, that, at least in Connecticut, we're calling for a repeal of that. The, the, the governor's executive order should not require Connecticut motorists and families to have to increase uh, their costs for travel. So, so my question was, it's an executive order, not a state legislature vote. Yes, the California's right. legislature did not adopt this. Connecticut's legislature right. didn't adopt this. And all the other states' legislatures did not adopt this. Right. So it's an executive order. And now the... Uh, uh, what do you call it? The, the, um, the regulators are now creating these laws, and then our governor just just ex signed on to it as an executive authority. Is that what happened? Chris, do you want to answer that again? What what state is this? Massachusetts. Uh, did I, did Governor Baker sign on to this as a sole executive, or did the legislature well, it, pass this? It happens automatically in those sixteen states because they're following the carb. Uh, rules. As Chris said, every state has to follow the EPA or the California CARB rules. So we follow, 16 states follow the CARB rules. So Newsom told CARB, you have to ban these engines by 2035, and now the other 16 states have to follow. So and that's, who, who authorized those, our, us, Massachusetts? In Massachusetts, I think it was 1995, we joined CARB. We were the second state. New York was first. I think uh, Vermont was third. But again, yeah. if you're looking in the 90s, 2000s, or even a few years ago before 2020, no one really knew that this was in the works. And that's part of the education process. And that's what so we were kind of saying. It was a legislative saying. vote in 95? Was a legislature that approved this? Uh, Mike, I'd have to just double check that. Most likely it would be. But again, 1995 looks a lot different from right now. No, but it's important to know. I mean, if it's an executive, it's all executive orders. That's kind of like, why, why are we giving this authority to one person. It should be the, the legislature, if not the voters. That's right. Um, it should I be part wanna... of the education, how, how it happened. Mm -hmm. That's all. Um, 
Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead and ask your question, Michael. Okay. Um, my, my question is, um, can somebody explain planning? Meg, I think this is one of your uh, reporters. You might want to ask him. Um, Michael, we can't um, hear you. Oh, um, I'm going to type it. Um, okay. Okay. Chat. Uh, how much percentage? We can hear you now. Oh, oh, now you can. How much percentage when you buy a new electric car is subsidized? Federal Michael, why don't you go ahead and uh, send a question via the chat? There's there's no way we can get your question. And while you're typing it, we'll go to anyone else in the media that has any other questions. I did hear a, a part of it. And, and I will just add that um, the federal uh, electric vehicle income tax credit was utilized 85% uh, of that credit was taken by people who have six figure incomes. It's just re-emphasizing that, you know, if you're a single mom who's, you know, paycheck to paycheck or, or any family that's paycheck to paycheck, uh, the tax credit incentives are something that uh, is, is almost exclusively utilized by people who are wealthy enough to be able to purchase them anyways. And that's why I think that uh, the, the consumer choice part of this issue is so important that people should be able to make up their own minds. Last time I checked, it was America. Last time I checked, you know, people know what's in their own best interests. And, and I think that, that this is, is an overreach. And at least if it is this education process that uh, Mass Fiscal is leading is going to, I think, help allow the public to engage policymakers to say that I didn't elect the governor of California, I elected you. I want, I want you to be able to make that choice and protect my family from higher costs, protect our electric grid from failure. Um, I think that that's sort of the point. I, I, I know that that wasn't his whole question, but I, I kind of caught part of it. Yep. Yeah, I, Thank I, you. I, 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 may I, may I say something? Hi, may I say something? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that I would like to highlight is the fact that, you know, when I, uh, when I said that, this basically scores political points. Um, and so politicians, you know, they can, you know, think that maybe they'll win some votes in 2022, or this is a great posturing. You know, when we look at the electorate, people like to divide uh, voters into different sort of groups, but the largest group is fossil fuel consumers. And so this affects every single every single American who doesn't drive an electric vehicle, which is the vast majority. Um, and so I, I think that, especially when I look at Vermont, and I do understand that, you know, we have to look at the legislatures, we have to look at everything differently. Um, the, the pressure needs to come from bottom up. And when every single Vermont or every single American understands that not only are we, are we saying, okay, well, we have inflation and the gas price might go to $5 per gallon, you also can't buy, you can't use the vehicle that you're using right now. And so having those two together, um, I think that would really create a lot of pressure on politicians not to go along with that. But it starts by, you know, letting every single fossil fuel consumer understand what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt Murphy's got a question. Matt, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Thanks, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. I think um, to, to the questions about Massachusetts, I believe this was authorized by the legislature under the Massachusetts Clean Air Act. Is that correct? Originally uh, yes. in 1995. Tied. Yes. Okay. But obviously the, the ice ban was not even yes, conceived. right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just wondering if anyone here has is familiar with or can explain how um, well, ha has California re have California regulators put this rule? Have they acted on Governor Newsom's executive order or was this on hold until yesterday when the EPA gave California back its authority to set more stringent uh, emission uh, requirements? Chris, would you know that answer? Yeah, the, the, they have start. They did commence the uh, process to start to uh, promulgate the regulations. So it's. Um, I don't think that they're waiting for uh, for EPA, the, the federal 
government's decision to give them their authority back. So um, there, there has a process that has started. We plan on participating, submitting comments um, on it while we, we try to get Connecticut to repeal this automatic adoption. Um, so, okay. Thank you. Were these were these laws in these sixteen states tying uh, themselves to California? Um, were they in effect uh, pending appeals of the Trump administration's removal of California's ability to set its own standards? Was that um, or was that something that got paused during that during this like several year period? No, it did not get paused. Um, the, there are there are two, two like like we stated before there are two uh, programs that states can adopt either EPA's or California's and even though that was um, their authority to continue to have have that power was suspended the regulations remained in place. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, I don't think there's any other questions, so we can wrap it up. I know it's half an hour into it. Um, Thank you all for your time and um, any media people, if you don't have the letter, if you don't have Newsom's executive order, we're happy to get you that. Um, and obviously, if you wanted to ask any follow-up questions, just shoot us an email and uh, we could send it to the appropriate person. Thank you all for your time today. See you.